All right, so we have finished chapter two, lesson five, using models to show division of fractions. And there were some of you that you were doing this and you're like, wow, hey, I get this, this is pretty easy. You know, I've been a teacher for a couple of decades now, and I can tell usually by this point who's really gonna understand this lesson and who's really gonna be like, I have no idea what's going on. And the thing about this lesson is, the majority of you are in this category. And I knew that and I expected it. And if you were listening at the end of class, I told you, don't stress about it. This is not one of those where I'm expecting you all to have 100% on your assignment because I wanted the ones that can see this, understand, hey, it's okay if you use models to do math. I knew the majority of you, it was gonna be a struggle. And all I asked was that you attempt it. When I grade these assignments, I don't check for a single correct answer. I check for effort. If you did the effort, then you get points of participation. It's just a completion grade. Right? So I tried to reiterate that to you before you left, not to stress about it. But then hopefully your parents got my message because I also sent an email about, hey, please don't let them stress. I sent them home with a tough lesson. I knew it was a tough lesson. Just wanted to give them, you know, something that was a little challenging to see if they really had grit. And some of you, you're just like, I just don't get it. I want to use my free card. That's fine. That's what free cards are for. I'm good with that. Okay? You know, this whole lesson, somebody asked yesterday, well, then why are you teaching if you know a lot of us are going to struggle? Because, you know, there's this thing called frog legs that I absolutely love. I can go to a buffet and I can get frog legs on, I fill up my plate and then I can go back and get another one and I can go back and get another one. And there is no one in my family that sits there and says, oh yes, please share. They don't get it. Even my wife says, what is that all about? Well, some people get it, some people don't. I'm not gonna force everybody to enjoy frog legs. I'm not gonna force everybody to use the model part of division. If you get it, fantastic. Put that in your back pocket. That's another tool that you can use because there's always more than one way to do a math problem. Now we're gonna skip a lesson because I don't wanna cause more confusion and more frustration before I actually teach you how to divide fractions. So we're gonna skip all the way over to the next lesson, which is chapter two, lesson seven. In chapter two, lesson seven, we're gonna look at the mathematical setups to do division. Now here's the thing. I gave you a piece of paper a couple weeks ago and on the front had three different functions of math. At the top, fractions, adding. In the middle, fractions, subtracting. Close to the bottom, fractions, multiplication. At the very bottom, what do I do if it's a whole number in multiplication and division? What do I do if it's a mixed number in multiplication and division? And then when you flipped it over, the whole backside was what this lesson is all about. If you have that piece of paper, you should probably get it out because I'm gonna to continue to go through it. If you've lost that piece of paper, I made 10 extra copies and they're all gone. So if you don't have it in your folder, you've lost it, maybe it's in that avalanche of papers out, stuck in your bottom of your locker that continues to grow because you don't take anything home, I'm not gonna go out and look for it for you. Okay. So you might write the steps down as I go through them in the lesson. If you are a person and you understood lesson five, and you get the models and it really works for you, fantastic. Keep that in mind because if you get a little confused here or there or you get down to crunch time and there's a fraction problem on your test and you just don't get it, you can draw a model. See, I knew there were a few of you that were really going to get it because you use models already as you're doing your math, and I've seen that over the past couple of weeks. And so I knew, hey, they need to see this lesson. And I knew that the majority of you, you're a fundamental mathematician. You want a process. You want to set up. You want steps. And then you're going to be able to do it over and over and over again. And that's fine also because there's always more than one way to do math. And if you didn't get this lesson, okay, forget it. Throw it away. You don't put it in your memory. You don't have to be able to do it. I will never require you to do it on a test. I've never seen it on a standardized test. So you're going to be okay, I promise. When I get into chapter two, lesson seven, I've got three new ways that I can set up division of fractions. I don't do all three ways because after the first way, 
I've got some of you that are so confused and so frustrated, you just want to know how do I do these. So I'm only going to do one way. We're going to start and we're going to skip through a couple of these problems because we're going to go straight to what works, always works, is on the back sheet of that first paper that I just mentioned with all the functions of mathematics. First, we have to have some base understanding. First thing is, I can't divide fractions. Mathematics, if I set it up on my paper, I cannot divide fractions. Some of you will say, well, you know, I've got this really nice calculator. It's a scientific calculator. I can type in fractions and I can divide fractions. It gives me the answer. I get that. That doesn't show me that you know how to do it. Well, I've got this phone and this phone has an app that's really fancy. And I take a picture of my math problem and it shows me what the answer is. Great. A phone can do it. But that doesn't show me that you can. Computers. You can go to different applications and websites. And even though it can tell you the answer, it doesn't show me you know how to do it. I'm going to teach you how to do it. The second thing before I teach you how to do it is that we have to understand a fancy word here. Okay? So it's in your book. It's a vocabulary word. It might pop up, pop up on your test next week. What is this fancy word reciprocal? Well, reciprocal means something very simple when it comes to a definition. And I think they just like to sound more important than I am to talk way up here. Because I'm more of a, I like to talk as a sixth grader so that you understand me. Separate reciprocal just means I'm going to flip my fraction. That's it. That's all it means. That's its definition. I'm going to use the word reciprocal because you're going to hear the word reciprocal. You're going to see it on tests. You're going to see it on assignments from this point forward. And you're going to see it in the future when you do your math classes. So it's, under, it's important that you know that that's a math term that you should know how, what it means. It just simply means to flip your fraction. If I understand that, then I can look at two fifths, and if I say, well, I'm just going to flip my fraction, because that's what a reciprocal is, okay, then it should be an easy concept. Now, notice the pigtail. I call it a pigtail. To me, that is my symbol that says flip the fraction. Most people get it, you know, if you look at it, it's like a fancy P, okay, that's why I call it a pigtail. But it just means, hey, I need to turn this upside down, I need to flip it. I'm not saying that that needs to be yours. I had one student last year because I don't, I don't like that. Can I just put an R for a capital R for reciprocal? Absolutely. Okay. This is just for me. It's a visual. When I do it with my hand, I know that tells my brain flip it as I'm writing it down. Okay? That's why I do it. If I flip this two fifths, what do I get? Well, I get an improper fraction, Mr. Bean. You said not that I can't use that as my answer. And you're right, five halves can never be used as an answer unless we're doing ratios, which is later on. But when I am doing a math problem, I can definitely use an improper fraction. So if I'm going to change these into a reciprocal, I'm just going to flip it upside down. Fat 7 20 fits. Once again, hey, that's top heavy. When I turn it upside down, you're right. And that's okay because I can use that in my math problem. 11 12 still I'm going to turn it upside down. I'm just going to flip it. So I'm going to have 12 over 11. This is what I need to do on the section where I find a reciprocal. I do not do it to every single step. Once again, another step before we move on. Well, what about these problems in this multiplication division where they give me a whole number? You said that we couldn't use a whole number, and you're right. Okay, so I had to go step by step on what I did teach you. So when I see a multiplication of fractions or a division of fractions, what do I do with that whole number? If you don't remember, you look at the very bottom of that paper on the multiplication section, and it's where the star is. It says, remember, I always put my whole numbers over one. Okay? Once I do that, pause. If I put three over one, I'm going to relate it to breakfast donuts because I love donuts. Okay? If I am one person and I get three donuts, I'm pretty satisfied with three donuts. I'm good with that. But if I accidentally write it upside down and I put my one over my three, then that means the three donuts that are in front of me, I only get one of them. I'm not so happy. You don't get this shape by eating one donut for your breakfast. So I have to make sure that I put my three over my one so I do not change my value. Three donuts is three donuts and we're good with keeping it a whole number. 
Once I have my three over one, then I find my reciprocal. Every once in a while, I get somebody that gets this flipped around in their head. They put the one over the three, and then they find the reciprocal, which goes back three over one, and three is three. That's the same value. So it's all going to be a wrong answer. Make sure you start out by showing the whole number over one, and then you can flip it. Then it just becomes one third. If I have a larger whole number, it's still the same process. I'm going to take my 15. I'm going to start out by putting it over 1 because I know I can't use a whole number in these math problems. And then, if it's in the section to flip where I need the reciprocal, then we flip it and it becomes 1 15. Well, what about those ones, which is not on today's homework, but what about those ones where it has a mixed number? You said we couldn't use those in multiplication and division, and you're right, we can't. So if it's in the reciprocal section of the problem, then I have to make it an improper fraction first. That's also at the bottom of the multiplication section over to the right. So I start at the bottom and I multiply. So I have my four times my seven, which gives me 28. Then that answer gets added to the numerator that's there. So I have 28 plus three, which gives me a new numerator of 31. And then I always keep the denominator that I'm starting with. So that would change into, in order to use, 31 fourths, but if it's in the reciprocal section, then I have to flip it, and then it becomes 4 over 31. All right, so let's get into the math. When I see this, now I put some white boxes over this, which I know you can't tell, so it's kind of like my own little magic trick on PowerPoint, but it erases all this information because I'm not going to go through the three different processes that I teach you. I'm going to go through the third process, which is the best way I think that all of you Every person, even the ones that got less than five, are going to be able to do and repeat over and over and over again. It's important, and I say it on every video, I've been putting this image up here, that you follow along. Because I'll be honest, yesterday, as I was in the back helping some people on some questions, I was watching, I saw two different people that they were staring around, they weren't really listening, they weren't paying attention, and then when they saw that I had written an answer down here, some steps, they quickly focused here, and they started writing it down in their book while I'm trying to teach on this problem. If you're not listening, following along, and filling out your book step by step, you're not getting it. That's not the point of this. The point of this is I can work through a problem, and you can hit rewind, and I can work through a problem, and you can hit rewind, and I can work through a problem, and you can hit rewind, and it, getting the point? I don't have to repeat my steps 40,000 times you can repeat it for you with these videos. You can do it at home. Your parents can watch it. It's fun Saturday night to sit there and watch Mr. B trying to teach math. Make sure you're following along, please. Ears on, brain engaged, filling it out as I go through it so I know you're learning it. Because those of you that aren't, that's where you're really struggling. Because then you come to me like, well, I don't get it. Show me your book. Well, I filled it out. But did you fill it out while I was teaching it? Well, no, I waited until you had an answer and then I did. You're not helping yourself and I'm trying to help you in every possible way that I can. Second thing is if you are, are not organizing, you do not have that piece of paper that I mentioned a moment ago with all four math functions on it, adding, subtracting, multiplying, whole numbers, mixed numbers, and then on the back, the division, then you might want to write these steps down. I've told you to keep those kind of things in your math folder. Some of you have no idea where it is and out of my 10 extras, they're all gone. I'm not going to print more off, so now you got to put forth the extra effort since you weren't organized and keeping your things where I told you to. I advise you to write these steps down on a piece of paper. Knowing these steps is key to being able to do these math problems. I can't divide fractions. I can't show my work to do a division of fractions. So I have to know how to change it into a math problem that I can do. And if you have that piece of paper, then make sure you're looking at the division side and you'll see it's the same steps. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to keep my first fraction. It has to stay, okay? I don't do anything else with it. My second step is simply changing my division into multiplication, which we know how to multiply fractions. And then my first step, or third step, excuse me, that's where the reciprocal comes into play. I flip the second one. Has to be turned upside down. Okay? Once I do that, I have a math problem that I know how to solve. I have multiplication of fractions. And that's the easy fraction work that we've ever done. We can then do that. 
So I'm going to go through those steps and we're going to fill it out. Once again, if you don't have that written down, if you don't have the paper that I originally gave you and told you to keep your mat folder, I advise you to pause the video and get those steps written down so you have it in front of you, especially when you go home to do your assignment. So we're going to keep our first fraction. So I'm just going to bring down my two thirds. It stays. It's the only thing in the problem that does stay. My second step, I'm going to change division into multiplication. Cut my multiplication sign. My third step, I know I'm going to find the reciprocal. I'm going to flip my second fraction. My second fraction is 1 sixth, so therefore I can turn it upside down. I'm going to get 6 over 1. Now, multiplication of fractions. It's the easy fraction work. I can do that. Remember, we inserted a new step instead of just multiplying across. Now we asked, can I cross reduce? And on a lot of these, I can cross reduce. Three does go into six evenly. That makes me having smaller numbers in my math, which makes my math easier as well. So I'm gonna take three into both of those. Remember reducing is dividing a top and a bottom by the same number. Can't change, it'll be different numbers. So if I have three going into both of those, then I ask three goes into three, how many times? One. And then I ask, three goes into six, how many times? Two. All right, now I've reduced. I can't reduce this two over one. So how do I multiply fractions? I multiply straight across. My numerators, two times two gives me four. One times one gives me one. Now I have four over one. Keep in mind, this is now the answer. I can use this to do math. I can't have it as my answer unless I'm doing ratios which is later on. So four over one, I have to show is my whole number. Any number over one is just the top number by itself. So I know I'm gonna show four, but this came along with a story problem, right? So it's talking about a board, and if I cut it into pieces that are one six, how many pieces would I get? Well, then I would have to have my label. I would be four pieces. Now your book shows you two more ways to do this math problem, skip those you're going to find where it starts talking about Winnie, kind of like Winnie the Pooh, spelled the same way. And it says that Winnie needs pieces of string for a craft project. So before you start writing, make sure you're on the right one, because you're going to skip a couple that are in your book. Once again, I've whited this section out, so if you have a hard time showing your work over the stuff that they've given you, just get the white paper from over here, then you'll be okay. Same steps. What are the steps? Going to review them. So I know I can divide fractions, so what do I have to do? I'm going to keep my first one, that's my step one. I'm going to change division into multiplication, that's step two. I'm going to flip my second fraction, and that is my step three. Sorry, just got to make sure everything's okay with my wife, she's texting me twice. So when I'm doing that, I make sure I follow those steps and I have it set up correctly. So I want to keep my first one. That's my first step, right? So I'm going to drop down my three-fourths. I'm going to use that exactly the way it's written. My second step we said was to change division to multiplication, so I put my x. And then my third step was to find the reciprocal, or flip, my second fraction. So instead of 1 12 I'm now going to have 12 over 1. All right. Now it's multiplication. That's the easy stuff. I can do that. Check to see if I can cross-reduce. Ah, I've got a 4 and a 12, and 4 is a factor of 12, isn't it? So, I know I can reduce by 4. 3 and 1, well, 1's not a prime number, it's not a composite, nothing goes into it, so I can't reduce. 3 would be a prime anyway, so it doesn't help me if I just say, yeah, I can reduce by 1's, it doesn't change them. So I'm going to reduce by my 4's, once again, divide top and bottom by the same number. 4 goes into 4 how many times? One time. 4 goes into 12 how many times? 3 times. Now I'm left with multiplication of fractions. I can do that. That's easy stuff. How do I multiply fractions? Multiply straight across. So I'm going to have 3 times 3, which gives me 9. 1 times 1, which gives me 1. And then I have a top-heavy answer. So I know I'm going to change it towards just the whole number. And if it's a story problem, like this one about winning, I'm going to make sure I have the correct label. This was pieces. All right, so here are our practice problems. 
the share and show. So make sure you're in the right area. Same steps every single time. Okay. So once again, I'm going to keep my first one. All right. So I have five, six. I'm just going to bring it down. And then I'm going to change my division of multiplication. All right. So I'm going to make sure that I put an X there. And then I'm going to flip my sec second fraction. And that's not a fraction, is it? So I know that I have to change my three into three over one. So I'm going to keep my five, six. But my three is going to change into three over one. So if you want, just put a line under three and a one. It works. Going through the steps to set it up into a math problem that I can do then, since I can't divide fractions, I keep my five, six. Division becomes multiplication. Now I can flip my three over one into one third. I check to see if I can cross reduce. One and six, no. Nope. Five and three, no. Nope. So I multiply across, or I multiply across, five times one is five. 6 times 3 is 18. Can't be reduced. I always check just in case I didn't reduce properly over here. But 5 18 is as low as I can go. 5 will not go into 18 by itself. And 5 is a prime number. So I know that my answer is just 5 18. All right, number 2. Start with always keeping my first one. Then my second step, change division to multiplication. And then my third step, flip my second fraction. So when I flip 1 8, I get 8 over 1. Before I multiply, see if I can cross reduce. I have a 4 and an 8. That works. A 1 and a 3. That doesn't work. So 4 will go into 4 and 8 evenly. So I'm going to reduce by 4s. 4 goes into 4 how many times? Once. And 4 goes into 8? Twice. That leaves me with a 3 and a 2 in my numerator is a 1 and a 1. Multiplication. Multiply across. 3 times 2 is 6, and 1 times 1 is 1. I ended up with 6 over 1, but I know i got to write it as a whole number if my denominator is a 1. All right, so number 3. doesn't look complicated, right? So I know I'm going to go through my steps. 3 fifths. I'm going to keep my first one. I have division, so I'm going to change it to multiplication. What do I do with my second one? Flip it upside down, right? So I know I'm going to change it into 10 over 3. See if I can cross reduce and look at this one. I can cross reduce the threes. I can cross reduce the five and the 10. I'm gonna have a lot smaller numbers to deal with. So three and three, they automatically cancel out and become ones. The five and the 10, well, five goes into five one time and five goes into 10 two times. So make sure that you cross reduce both ways to get to the lowest numbers that I can deal with. Now that I have one and one and two and one, I multiply across. Some of you in that setup, once you cross reduce, you're automatically going to know that your answer is two. Some of you don't. And that's why we show those steps. So we're going to multiply across. We're going to get two over one, which can't be left that way. Can't be left as an improper fraction in my answer. So then I have a whole number of two as my answer. All right. So maybe something to get a little bit more complicated, but still, should be pretty easy as long as you're following those steps. And I'll say it one last time. If you don't have them written down, please write them down. If you have the paper I've already given you, then you have them written down and you're good to go. I have three fourths divided by five six. I cannot divide fractions, but I can change it into a math problem that I can do. My first step, I'm gonna keep my first fraction. So I write down my three fourths. Second step, division becomes multiplication. Yep, I can do that. And then I flip my second fraction. So instead of having five six, I have six fifths. I check to see if I can cross reduce. Three and five, nope. Now four and six. Four doesn't go into six evenly, right? But I can still cross reduce. I know that they're both even, so I can reduce by twos. So I'm gonna go ahead and cross reduce those. Two goes into four how many times? twice and two goes into six three times now i'm left with multiplication i multiply across i have three times three which is nine and my two times my five which is ten and when i see nine tenths can't be reduced so nine tenths is my final answer going to five i got a problem from the very beginning don't i 
I have a whole number. And I said, anytime that I see multiplication or division and there's a whole number or a mixed number, they have to be changed. So that three needs to be written as three over one. You can write three over one on top of it, or if you just put a line and a one underneath it, you've done what you need to do. Now, I can do my steps. Step number one, keep my first fraction. So I keep it as three over one. Division becomes multiplication, and then I flip my second fraction. Once I flip my second fraction, that's gonna allow me to cross reduce my threes. And once again, if it's the same number top and bottom, they just got to get crossed out and become ones. Now I'm left with multiplying straight across. One times four is four. One times one is one. I end up with four over one. However, that can't stay my answer, right? Have to take my top number, my numerator, and just write it by itself to make it a whole number of four. All right, so number six. Same steps. I'm going to keep my first one. Division becomes multiplication. Then I flip my second fraction. So now I have one half times four thirds. Multiplying fractions. I can do that. That's the easy stuff. See if I can cross reduce. Sure can, can I? One and three can't, but two and four sure can. So I'm going to take two into both of them since they're even. Two goes into two one time. And two goes into four twice. Now I multiply straight across. One times two is two. One times three is three. And that gives me a final answer of two thirds. And then I have number seven. Five twelfths divided by three. It's got to be changed, right? Got to be changed to three over one. Okay. So make sure you do that before you start bringing everything down and flipping it because it'll mess up your answer if you don't. So I keep my first one, I have 5 twelfths. Division becomes multiplication. I flip my second fraction, I have now one over three or one third. See if I can cross reduce. Can't do five and three, I can't do one and 12. So all I'm left with is multiplication. If I multiply straight across, I'm gonna get five times one, which is five, and 12 times three is just 36. And I know this doesn't end with a five or a zero, so I cannot reduce. So I know I've gotten to my right answer. All right, so when I look at eight and nine, notice I already started out with putting my two over my one. When I have it, then I want to keep it. Division becomes multiplication. I flip my second fraction, so I have my eight over my one now, and I can't cross reduce, can I? So I'm going to multiply straight across, and what are you going to get? So hopefully you thought 16. If you didn't say 16, if that wasn't what popped into your head, then you're going to end up with 2 times 6, which is 16, over 1, because 1 times 1 is 1. But then, once you had that written down, hopefully you said, ah, can't have it that way. So I have to have 16 as a whole number for my answer. And then number 9, 3 fourths divided by 3 fifths. So I'm going to keep my first one. Oh, we'll come back to number nine. I apologize. All right, so let's do number 12. This is an order of operations math problem, right? So I have to make sure that I do my order of operations correctly. I know that I have absolute values, square roots, exponents, and parentheses all at the very beginning. I do all of those that I possibly can. Then, and only then, do my, I do my standalone multiplication and division from left to right. Then, and only then, I do my addition and subtraction that stands alone from left to right. So I know I have to start with parentheses, right? And that's addition. So i got to go back to the top of my paper that Mr. B gave me because I may not remember exactly how to add fractions. Can I add fractions? Yes. What do I have to have? Common denominator, right? So once again, when I add and subtract fractions, I like to stack them. I think it's easier to see and to change my fractions. I know exactly what I'm doing. Does the smallest denominator go into the largest one evenly? Now, before I said if I multiply by opposite denominators, it will always give me my right answer, and that's right. And that's always the best way to begin. Now we're gonna start looking to see if the smallest one will go into the biggest one even, evenly so that I have fewer steps to do when I get through it. But if you still get confused with this, then go ahead and multiply opposite denominators, and you'll get a denominator of 50. The easier step, so I take one step out at the end, 
five will go into 10 evenly, so I know I can keep my 1 tenth as one of my numbers. But that tells me I have to change my 5 into a denominator of 10. How do I change it into a denominator by 10? Just multiply by 2, right? Because 2 times 5 is 10. That means I have to multiply my numerator by 2 as well. Don't forget that step. Because if I don't do both, I get a completely different value. I only want to get completely different digits. I want the value to stay the same. So now I have my 2 times my 5, which is my 10, and 2 times 3, which is 6. Now do I have a common denominator? I do. And the paper tells me to do what with it? Keep it. So I'm going to put down my denominator, and then I can add my numerators. 6 plus 1 is 7. So I have the number of 7 tenths, and I'm not done, am I? So where was the parentheses? It was in front. Knowing where that answer is is going to be vital when I do order of operations, especially when I have division of fractions. Because if I put it in the wrong spot, it completely changes my answer. So I'm going to have my 7 tenths, which means I'm going to keep that one, right? If this is 7 tenths, I'm going to keep it. So I'm just going to leave it down here where I was, and then I'm going to change everything else and bring it down. So my division becomes multiplication. My whole number of 2, I've got to put 2 over 1. Then I flip my second fraction, and I'm going to have 1 over 2. Now, can I cross-reduce? No, because 1 and 10 and 2 and 7, neither of those cross-reduce. So I'm going to multiply across, and I have 7 times 1 in my numerator, 10 times 2 in my denominator. So I know I'm going to have 7 twentieths now as my final answer. All right, so back to this problem, number 9. I want you to do number 9 on your own, just like Cap is telling you. Show your work, pause the video, and then come back to me and see if you're correct. So I'm hoping you did as I asked, and you have an answer here for number nine. So on number nine, you should have kept your first one, which is three-fourths, changed division to multiplication, and then flipped three-fifths to five-thirds. And then look at it and cross-reduce your threes. Those will automatically cross out and both become ones. Four-fifths did not cross-reduce, so hopefully you just multiplied across and got five-thirds, or excuse me, five-fourths. Then you thought, ah, but I can't have an improper fraction. And I know my top number always goes inside the division box. So I have my five divided by my four, and when I divide those out, I get a whole number of one with a remainder of one. My remainder is always my numerator. My divisor is always my denominator. So hopefully you got the answer that was a mixed number of one and one-fourth. And if you didn't, pause the video and check out your work and see how you messed up. And if you don't see how you messed up, please come in to me and show me and I'll help you find the mistake. And then I also want you to do question 13. Now, if you noticed, it was the same setup as this question without parentheses. See if you get a different answer. Pause the video, get an answer, come back and check. All right, so hopefully you have an answer for question 13. And I'm hoping that when I reviewed the order of operations, you noticed how I emphasized about doing absolute value square root eight point seven parentheses first, and then multiplication and division from left to right. Because if you didn't start with this part portion here, your answer is wrong. I have to start with multiplication and division and work from left to right. I have to ignore the addition for now. So if I'm gonna start here, I'm gonna have one tenth divided by two. So I have my one-tenth, I kept it, division became multiplication, I flipped my second fraction, it was a two over one, so I flipped it to one over two. Nothing to cross-reduce, because both numerators are one, so you would have multiplied across and got one-twentieth. With that, then we have to add three-fifths and one-twentieths. Once again, you don't have to stack them, but I always do. So when I stack them, I have my three-fifths and I'm adding my one-twentieths. I saw that my 5 does go into 20 evenly. So I'm keeping my 1 tenth, my 1 20th and multiply by 4's here to get a common denominator of 20. So I have my 1 20th and 4 times 5 would be 20 and 4 times 3 would be 12. And then I would have kept my denominator and added my numerators. Notice this problem and this problem, the numbers and the signs were in the exact same order. The only thing that was missing was parentheses and I do not have the same answer, proving order of operations is indeed important that I do them in the right order. 
All right, so the rest of these then are there for us to review in case you're kind of struggling with this. But the key is those steps over there. Make sure you have them. As you're working through, if you just don't get it, you don't understand, now come back and help and ask me for help. I'm more than happy to help you. If you get it, you're ready to stand on your own. Your assignment is on up there on the board. Do the problems. Make sure you show all of your work. Don't skip your work because we're going to redo it if you skip your work. And then your, the rest of your time is yours.